What happens if we try to apply the multipole expansion of the electrostatic potential to a collection of point charges instead of a, an extended charge distribution? Can we do it? And the answer is yes, but we first have to look at that expansion and write down the appropriate form for point charges. So let's consider an example. We're asked here with a collection of three point charges that sit on the uh, vertical axis, the z-axis, we're asked to find the first three terms in the multipole expansion. And these charges consist of a point charge plus q at a distance a above the origin, a negative 2q charge at the origin, and a plus q charge at distance a below the origin. And we want to find the potential at some arbitrary point p whose location from the z-axis is given by the angle theta. All right. So in general, here's the expression. Uh, that we learned in the, from the textbook for the multipole expansion of a continuous charge distribution, which is the sum of a series of integrals, one for each of the terms in the multipole expansion. Okay? Now, when we go to point charges, instead of extended charge distributions, those integrals will be themselves become summations. Uh, so that, for example, if we look at the last term in the integral, this rho d tau, uh, d tau, remember, is a volume element, and rho is a charge per unit volume. So what this really represents inside an integral is a differential amount of charge, dq. And if we were to convert this entire expression, uh, the entire integral, to something that would be appropriate for discrete charges, all we really would need to do is to replace the summation, or sorry, to replace the integral with a sum, because now we have a finite number of charges, and we'll use the index i to denote the charges. And then the r prime will be r prime sub i. There will be a different r prime distance for each of the point charges. We still would raise that to the nth power, because that'll be different for each of the terms in the expansion. <laughs> then we'll have the Legendre polynomial p sub n of cosine theta, but now the theta, not being a continuous variable, will have a specific value for each of the point charges. So we'll call it cosine theta. Actually, originally we should have called it cosine theta prime, so we'll call it cosine theta prime sub i. And then we'll have a charge q sub i. So when we've got discrete charges, this is the right form to use in the multipole expansion. Not really too difficult. So armed with this new form, we can write down term by term the, uh, the individual terms in the multipole expansion. So let's just go right ahead and do that. Let's look at our charge distribution and look at the monopole term because, of course, it's the simplest. The monopole gives us the 1 over. Uh, looks like I'm going to have to offset this a little bit. So I'll go down. All right, so V monopole is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 0. And the first term will be uh, oh, times R right there. The first term, this is the n equals 0 term. So the 1 over R to the 0, that's just 1. So we're left with the, just the first summation, uh, the term for n equals 0. And this summation very nicely turns into something really simple. There are just the three charges involved. I equals 1 to 3 we'll put in so we know what we're summing up. The individual R I prime terms. Uh, then, well, let's see, for uh, the zeroth order Legendre polynomial is just 1. So that term, I'll write that in there to be explicit. That's 1. And the Q sub I is all that we have. Ooh, actually, look at this. R sub i prime is raised to the zeroth power. So that term even goes away. So all we really have to do is add up the point charges. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught r times the sum of the charges q sub i. And it's pretty easy to see from the diagram that we've chosen an example here to do where the sum of all the point charges is 0, plus q, plus q, minus 2q. And so this drops out, and that means 
that the monopole term is equal to zero. Not surprising when we have a neutral charge distribution. So that's pretty easy. It's a little bit more challenging, but not really that much more difficult to go on now and do the dipole and the quadrupole terms. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll leave up the general expression here, and now we'll look at the dipole term. Monopole term drops out. So what's different with the dipole term? 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, and now 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, right? And now in our summation, we've got the r prime term, r sub i prime, and that's raised to the first power now, so it doesn't drop out the way it did before. Now we have p sub 1, which itself is the cosine of the angle theta, so it's the cosine of theta i prime, and q sub i. Easy enough. But remember, and this is really important, that this angle theta can be different for the different charges that are represented in the sum, and that's going to be the case as we'll see right here. Theta, remember, is defined if you have an origin here and there is some point charge or charge element here. That vector that indicates its location is the r prime vector, and then the r vector goes to the point in space where we're trying to find the potential. So r is here, r prime is over here, and theta prime is the angle between them. And that's important as we write down the correct terms in this sum for the dipole term. So we've got 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. The sum again just has three terms. Well, the r prime sub i for the top charge is just a, right? And then you have the cosine of the angle that I've indicated in the sketch as theta. So I'll just write that down as cos theta and q. That's easy enough. Now the second term for the charge at the origin, negative 2, 2q, its coordinate is 0. It's at the origin. So that wipes it out completely. And the third term, which is the plus q below the origin, its r prime is a, right? But now look at the difference in the angle. The angle between the r prime vector, which would point straight down, and the r vector, which points to the point p, is now this angle here, which is pi minus theta. That's the new theta prime for the charge below the origin. So that has to be written down as cosine of pi minus theta. So the theta that's in the first term is the same as the theta in the third term in this expression, but the theta prime angles that gave rise to these terms were different. And then finally, the q here, right? So what do we need to know in order to evaluate this is what's cosine of pi minus theta? And it turns out, as you can confirm by plugging in some simple cases or by looking this up in a math book is that that's negative cos theta. So we can see right away that the first term and the third term will knock each other out. And once again, not only do we have a charge distribution where the monopole term is zero, but the dipole term is zero too. And so to get the first term that's non-zero in the expansion, we have to go to the quadrupole term. So let's do that now after I clean the screen off. So it's going to be pretty easy to remember these values. The first two terms are zero. So now I'm going to get a little more space here and work out the quadrupole term. It's really important to keep track of the angles, theta prime, and those distances, r prime, that are in the integrals that come out of the multipole expansion. So, last thing, quadrupole term. All right, here we go. 
v quad. Let's write it out and then we'll know how to substitute in and solve. We know now that it's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught and let's see the uh, dipole term had the r squared so the quadrupole term has the r cubed and the summation that follows will have r prime i equals 1 to 3 r prime cubed times the appropriate Legendre polynomial now which is the second order Legendre polynomial and that one is 3 halves of cosine squared theta prime minus 1 half and let's not forget the charge q sub i whoops and in my r prime the first term in the sum that should be r prime sub i because each charge could have a different value for that all right so that's what we need to do right now and this again this theta prime is also indexed by i so what do we have here well once again we just make use of the fact that the the two angles that enter into this the theta prime angles one of them is is theta the other one's pi minus theta and so this becomes 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed. First term is going to have, well, r prime we know is a, so this is a cubed. And it will have 3 halves cos squared of theta minus a half. Good, no problem there. And then we've got, oops, I shouldn't be so hasty to close the Oh, no, that's right. That bracket is okay to close. Yeah, so I can close that bracket, but that's not the same as the bracket that's outside here. All right, so that one's good. Uh, the second term will drop out once again because the charge at the origin has an R prime of 0. And the third term, let's see if I can squeeze it in here, is A cubed times the Legendre polynomial cosine squared Ooh, boy, this is not good. I'm going to have to go back and put in the 3 halves term that I dropped out. You know what? What I need to really do is just clear some more space out so that I can do a better job of putting in this last term. So it's a cubed times 3 halves cosine squared of pi minus theta. Good minus a half and now I got to multiply by the charge Q alright finally I can close the parenthesis ah and now I realize I left that charge Q out of the first term in the sum so we'll go back and put it in now we're ready to go unless I've made some other mistakes so the quadrupole term here we can rewrite this because we do see one simplification 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed. And again, what we're going to get in each of these terms is q times a cubed. That's in both of them. So I might as well even put that out here right now. q a cubed. And these terms are added together. The cosine of pi minus theta is negative cosine of theta, but when we square it, we get cosine squared of theta because the negative sign cancels out when we square it. So this whole term becomes, well, we've got 3 halves cosine squared plus 3 halves cosine squared. So that just gives us 3 cosine squared theta minus a half minus a half. That gives us 1. So minus 1. And we get our final answer. So. Just to sum up again what we found out, for this particular collection of point charges, the monopole term is zero because it's neutral, the dipole term is zero because of the geometry, and the first non-zero term in the multipole expansion is the quadrupole term. Very interesting. And that's how we take the general multipole expansion and apply it to the case of a collection of point charges.